In 2 Samuel 11, I want to start reading a story. I normally start with a story. Well, we're going to go through a story. And I told you, it's, it's not a story I grew up listening to when I was a little kid. So check out this story. It says right here, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, <laughs> already when it starts, you realize, I guess back then, when it's springtime, when, when March 21st hits, it's like, get your battle gear on, and it's like scheduled war, okay? Um, if you're a real man and you're like, dude, I want to get in the battle, you're like, you're waiting all winter for your battle time, I guess, is how it works, okay? Um, but it was the time of war, and it says this, David sent out Joab. Joab was the leader of his army, and he sent out Joab, Joab and all his men and the whole Israel army, and they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. It's weird how it says that David remained in Jerusalem. You get a sense kings were supposed to go to war with their troops. Didn't mean they had to be in the front lines, but... <laughs> But they were there. It was a morale thing. They were supposed to be. It was almost like, hey, I'm here too. Let's do this together. He was supposed to be at war, <coughs> but he didn't go to war. And you come to this story that we are going to talk about today and check it out. It says this. So one evening, David, King David, got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. So he's walking around the roof of the palace. I don't know. Did he have a bad dream? I don't know. Could he not sleep? Did he have too much caffeine that night? And so all of a sudden, his, his memories and like he just can't sleep, just going back and forth. Who knows? But it says he's walking on the roof. And as he's walking on the roof, you see his palace is higher. It's up on the hill. It's above everywhere in Jerusalem. Everything's below his roof, okay? He's like the high skyscraper of Jerusalem. And as he's walking around one evening, it says this. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. Okay, now, when he says he saw a woman bathing, one is back then, a lot of times women, they would bathe outside and maybe in their backyard or whatever there was. And normally when you bathe, that means you are naked. Okay? So there is this woman bathing naked, and he's up on the roof, and I don't know if he's like, oh, a woman ba bathing. Okay, whoop -dee. Or maybe, because here's what it says, it says that not only notice her, it all of a sudden says, the woman was very beautiful. So he sees this woman, is like, whoa, that girl's hot, okay? So he sees this naked woman bathing, and it says, David sent someone to find out about her. And the man said, the man said, oh, isn't that Bathsheba? Oh, she's the daughter of Elam. The wife of Uriah the Hittite. We find out later, later, Uriah the Hittite is one of his main military men. Like legit. Who's, where is he right now? Where is Uriah the Hittite not right now? Yeah, where is David supposed to be? War, right? He's there. So it says this. Then David sent messengers to her, and she came to him, and it says he slept with her. Had sex with her right there. Bam. Told you. It's rated R. I didn't learn this when I was in junior high. Okay? Brings this girl to him. She's beautiful. He's like, dude, I want that girl. All right? And he has sex with her. Sends her away. It says she had purified herself from her own cleanliness. Then she went back home. And the woman conceived and sent word to David saying, yo, David, guess what? Remember that one night, that one night stand we had? I'm pregnant. Whoa. <laughs> no one told me this story when I was a kid. It's like I thought David killed Goliath. He was this great king. He became the Messiah. The, the Messiah came from his line. I'm like, dude, yo, King David, that's who I want to be like that. I've never heard this story back then. All right? So, She's like, yo, I'm pregnant. Now, he's like, what do I do? Ha, 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 ha. It's smart, though, okay? What happens normally when you sin and make a mistake? What do you normally try to do first? Lie to what? Cover it up, right? You want no one to know, right? I mean, look it. If the king of God's army does something like this, is that pretty bad? Heck, yeah. So what does he do? Sends word to Joab. Remember, the king of his troops. And he says, Send me Uriah the Hittite. 
and Job's son of David. And it says, when Uriah came to him, he said, Uriah, I'm so sorry. It's my fault. I apologize. I messed up. I slept with your wife. She's pregnant. If you want to stab me as many times as you want, you can. Is anybody reading that with me? Is that what it says? No. No. Here's what he says. David asked him, hey, how's Joab? How are the soldiers? How's the war going? Hey, why don't you go take a shower? Go home to your wife. You know, you've been at war for a while. Why don't you go hang out with her? Now, now why do you think he's telling her to do that? He's been gone for a while. He's got this beautiful wife. Hey, why don't you go have sex with your wife? Hoping they have sex, and then it's like, oh, honey, guess what? I'm pregnant. He's like, no way. It must have been that one night David told me to go, you know, that kind of thing, right? Right? You see what's going on? He's trying to cover it up. But guess what happens? David sent him, even gave him a gift to sin with him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and would not go down to his house. And he's like, oh, crud, my plan is not working out well. So what does he do next? If we read again, he says he gets him drunk. Gets him drunk, thinking he's going to be drunk. Now I'll send him home, and he'll be drunk. He'll see his wife, you know, boom, right? You guys are like, trap, this isn't the Bible? Yeah, isn't this crazy? I'm telling you, you should read the Bible more. There's crazy stories like this, okay? So he sends her back. But guess what? Even though he's drunk, what does he do that night? He doesn't go home. He again sleeps on the doorstep. So now King David's like, why aren't you going? He's like, there's no way I can go sleep with my wife when all my friends, all my soldiers at battle. And so... David doesn't know what to do. He wants to cover us up, so what does he do? He sends him back. Sends him back, and now he's freaking out. Like, what am I going to do? So what does he do? He sends with Uriah a letter for Joab, the king of his troops. And you know what he tells the king of the troops? They say, hey, listen, tomorrow morning when you're fighting the Ammonites and you're fighting in battle, here's what I want you to do. Without Uriah knowing it, I want everyone else to retreat, but leave Uriah out there alone against all the Ammonites. Okay, if you're in a huge battle and you have your thousand forces and you're beating the Ammonites and then all of a sudden everyone retreats except one, what's probably going to happen to the one? It's going to die. So what happens? Joab obeys him. Uriah's out in the middle. They retreat. What happens to Joab? I mean, not to Uriah. He dies. And then King David, being the nice king he is, he goes and consoles Bathsheba. I'm so sorry about your husband. Hey, why don't you come live with me? Problem solved. You know, I was thinking as I was reading through that, I I know the future. I know the future. I know that you guys know the Messiah, Jesus. What line did he come from? I already said it. He came from the line of David. That was an amazing, amazing, amazing thing. Everyone, do you know who everyone's favorite king was for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years? What is the king that everyone said was the greatest king? David. David. Yeah, we'll talk about Solomon later, how he was the richest, the wisest, but still when it comes to the best king, it was David because even God himself said, David, a man after my own heart. And I went, oh my goodness, there's a sin in there? He He slept with another man's wife, got her pregnant, and he killed the guy. Is that pretty bad sins? Okay? Is that pretty and terrible? Yes. But yet, I was reading through it. I was like, dang, how is he still considered a man after God's own heart? How? How do you do that and still have the line, you know, the Messiah come from your line? And then I was thinking, I know what it is. He's good at covering it up. You know what? If you want to be awesome, if you want people to like you, if you want to make sure you succeed, (laughs) cover it up. Don't let anybody know what sin you have in your life, because if you do it well enough, maybe, maybe you can have the Messiah come from your line. And I read that, and I went, oh, my. 
that crazy? Until I read the next chapter. If you have your Bibles, there's a story. It's amazing. You see, the Lord sent Nathan a prophet to David. He sends a prophet to him, and the prophet says, hey, David, I want to tell you a story. And David, if you're like me, we're like, we love stories. Dude, I got a good one. I got a really good one. Check out this story. He says, you know what? There were two men in a certain town. One was rich. The other was poor. You know, when you were rich, do you know what that normally meant? If you were rich, it means you normally had a huge house, you had tons of property, and you know what made you rich back then? It was your livestock. How many sheep, goats, cattle, all that stuff, that's what made you rich. So he's saying, guess what, this rich man, and guess what? He had a large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb. And he said, this you little, this you little, you little lamb, okay? I'm saying too many L's and it's messing me up. He brought, bought it, raised it, and it grew up with him and his children, and it shared his food. It drank from his cup. It even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now he says, let me tell you a story, though. This guy had this, and what happened is when he had it, a traveler came into town to the rich person's house. Back then, if someone came to your house and they were a traveler, you know what you normally did? You normally celebrated with a feast. You would normally go and kill one of your lambs or one of your goats or one of your cows, and you would slaughter it, and you would have an amazing feast to honor the traveler. But it says this in the story. It says, guess what? He didn't want to use one of his, so he went because he was bigger, stronger, stronger the bully, and it says he went and grabbed that guy's only ewe lamb, grabbed it, slaughtered it, and fed it to the traveler. And it says this when Nathan told him the story, it says that King David went nuts. It said, raging with anger, burning with anger, He's like, as surely as a man lives, you better bring him here because he will pay for that. He'll pay four times. I might even kill him. Like, he is furious. I mean, I'd be furious too. And what does he say? Nathan's awesome. He says, guess what? That man is you, David. And he says, guess what? You know how you tried to cover up that sin? God knew. God knew what you had done. You can't cover it up. I went, whoa. Whoa. He did cover, He did know what was going on. <laughs> Guys, you know what? We sin. We think when we don't tell anyone. We think when we cover it up with lies. We think when we do all this stuff, we think, ha, ha, no one knows. No, God knows. God knows. God knows what's in our heart. God knows what sins. No matter how many times you lie to your parents, no matter how many times you lie to others, you try to cover it up. God's like, I knew the whole time. Are you idiots? And you have a story where he said, guess what? Because of that. He said, David, there's going to be consequences. Because of that, there will be consequences. You know what one of them was? He says, for now, there will always be battles in your family. There's going to be war within your family. He said, you know what? Also because of that, your baby's going to die. That baby is going to die. There's consequences. So I read this, though, and I went, well, wait a minute. This is crazy. I don't know if you guys know this, but go back to the first king of Israel. Does anybody know who the first king of Israel was? Anyone? Anyone? Come on. Who? Saul. Saul was the first king of Israel, and David replaced him. Now, guess what? Saul was replaced because he sinned. And guess what? If you were to rate his sin, his sin, one of his major sins was he did a sacrifice that he was supposed to wait for Samuel the prophet to do the sacrifice. And God said, you know what? Because of the sacrifice, I told you not to, you're not going to be king anymore. So he gave the kingdom to David, a man after God's own heart. Now here's what's weird. I've been reading this whole thing. Did you know he never takes the, the throne away from David? Never. Okay. Did a sacrifice without getting permission. Had sex with another man's wife. She got pregnant and then killed the guy. What's worse? What is worse? How does David keep becoming, getting to stay the king? Why is the Messiah still under his line? Is, 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 
is God like, you know what, I said you're a man of honor. God, I don't really change my mind. You know, like, I gave you a kind of platform. It's like, I know you made mistakes, but you know what? You're my right hand, man. You're okay. Why? Why do you think? He did repent. He did repent. In fact, here's what we find out. We get a glimpse. Thank you so much. You're so right. We get a glimpse that the way David repented was what pleased God. What if there was a special way that it's how we respond to when we sin is what God cares more about? What if it's more about the response, not the, sp- the sin? What if the response is what's true in our heart? What if the response is like, yeah, David made mistakes, but you don't know his heart. I do. And you know what's cool is we start to get a glimpse of David's heart. And we start to realize that David truly repented. And we start to see a man that even though he did terrible things that we might never, ever do, you start to see the way he repented. And that's why God has no bad vibes with him anymore. And now we can look and go, you know what? Maybe there's some things we can learn from David. And so what I want to take a real quick, just look real quick at a story and show you three things that he did to show us what real, true repentance looks like. Because it's not like he said, God, my bad, so sorry. So, so sorry. No. I want to take a deeper look. Hey, guys in the back, I don't want to have to move you. Okay? You, don't, you can hug later. Okay? But right now, um, we're listening to the sermon. Okay? So here's the thing is first thing what true repentance looks like is this. David, when he said he was sorry, the first thing that we get from him is that he didn't make excuses. When you ask for forgiveness, the first secret of true repentance is don't make excuses. Don't make excuses. You know, it's funny. When we make mistakes, let's be honest, we always try to make excuses for why we did it. Well, mom, it wasn't all my fault. No, no, it would have been, I wouldn't have made the mistake if that wouldn't have happened. Imagine if David would have said, whoa, 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 yo, God, you know what? You're smoking something, okay? It is not my fault at all. I was walking on the rooftop. It's not my fault that there's this beautiful woman who's naked below me taking a shower. Why wouldn't she have showered inside? Why didn't she wear a conservative bathing suit? That would have been a lot better. I would not have thought she was that attractive. I would have been totally fine, and this would have never happened. Her fault. What what if he'd said that would have been perfect? Because guess what? You know what Saul did when he was caught in a trap of him doing the wrong thing, King Saul? He had excuses. Well, you know what? If Samuel would have been earlier, hey, we were going to die, but we really needed you. God, it's all your people's fault. And God's like, you don't get it. But you know what's interesting about David? Check this out. In chapter 12, verse 13, when Nathan said, it's you we're talking about, David did not go, yo, it's not totally my fault. Here is the only thing he said is, I have sinned against the Lord. It's all my fault. God, you are right. I can't believe you did it. I'm the idiot. I own it. Let me tell you what true repentance is. is when you make a mistake, you say it's my fault. God, it's my fault. I don't know why I did it. I love it. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, you see a secret here. If you confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. It says he will forgive you, but you got to confess it. David said, it's my fault. God, it's all my fault. Some of you are like, that's it? It's that easy? Yes. But why don't we do it? Because no one wants to be blamed for something. No one wants to be known as a sinner. No one wants to be known as, yep, I'm the one that killed Uriah. It's all my fault. Yep, I'm the one that cheated on him with Bathsheba. It's my fault. No one wants to be known for that. And David's like, yep, I did it. What if the first secret to true repentance is you just go, God, it's my fault. Yep, I can make excuses because that's not totally me, but it is me. You know, what's funny is we don't want our sin to define us, so we try to come up with excuses so it doesn't define us. And why don't we just go, you know what, I am a sinner. You know, I do struggle with those things. When I do look at naked, beautiful women, it makes me want to do things. I do have, it's my fault. 
Why can't we? Why can't we just confess it? Second thing is this. If you want true repentance or what it really looks like is this. Not only do you don't make excuses, but the second thing you see about David is he turned from his sin. And if you want to be the same way as David, you need to turn from your sin. I love this phrase, turn from your sin. Turning means this. It's not saying you never do it again. It doesn't say he never sinned like that again. You know why I say that? Because we're not perfect. We're going to sin again. God, I'm sorry I cussed. I'll never do it again. Tomorrow you cuss. Boom, hits you with lightning. You're dead. No. Okay? No, what you see from David is this idea of him turning from his sin. It's like he's turning around. What true repentance looks like is, one, is you don't make excuses, but the second thing is you turn. It is a turning that happens to say, God, I apologize, and I turn from it. I turn from my sin. 1 John 3, 6 through 7, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has ever seen him or known him. Little children, do not deceive yourselves. I love it. It says, No one is righteous that keeps on sinning. Well, I'm telling you something. We're going to keep on sinning because we're sinners. But I think what it's implying is they, they struggle with something and they turn from it. God, I don't want to do that. And there's a turning that happens. A turning, okay? There's a turning that happens. You know what we find out about David? It's crazy. But if you go back to the David and Goliath story, you guys know that story, right? A lot of you do. You've heard that story where David defeats Goliath. We get a little glimpse. It's crazy. Chris Brown taught me this. I got a glimpse that when David was wanting to fight Goliath, we get the human side of him. You know what I love about the Bibles? We see the human side. Every story, the disciples, when Jesus chose him, I thought it was all they gave everything, and I see the human side. They were having a rabbi ask them, and they're like, no way, a rabbi asked me to hang out with them. He could be the Messiah. We could be like the men. There was, there was a little bit of humanness to them. Every character in the Bible that's legit, there was still a human side, and that's what I love about it. And David was human. David loved the Lord. He wanted to honor the Lord. He felt like no one was greater than the Lord. But yet, still, you want to know one of the reasons why he went in that battle that day? Not only to to stick up for God, but second, he kept asking two or three times, what happens if somebody defeats Goliath? And they're like, dude, you will get the king's daughter and tons of money. And he's like, wait, wait, wait. Say that again. What will happen if I kill Goliath? chicks and bucks. You're going to get chicks, and you're going to get money. He's like, whoa, 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 say that again. So so if I kill Goliath, yep, you get women, and you get bucks. And what's starting to happen is you're seeing a little glimpse that guess what? Before David's sin there, you see that he struggled with women. How many wives does he have at this time? Several. Several wives at this time. You see he struggles with women. But here's what's interesting. I've been reading, I read commentaries after this sin, when it was brought to light, you never see him struggle or take on another wife after that day. God, I sinned, turned away. You never see it again. True repentance, you don't make excuses. You turn from your sin. And the last thing is this. Last thing we see is this, is that he accepted his consequences. He accepted his consequences. And I want you to understand something. For us as Christians, if you want true repentance, is you accept the consequence. I mean, the consequences. And you know what I mean by that? Check out this. It's at the end of this part. He's just been told his baby's going to die. Okay? And it says, It says in verse 15 of chapter 12, it says, After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the the child that Uriah's wife was born to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted, went in his house, and slept nights, the nights lying on the ground. The elders of the household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused, and he would not eat any food. On the seventh day the child died, David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was still living, we spoke to David, but he would not listen to us. 
How can we tell him now the child's dead? He may do something desperate. He's crying out to the Lord. He's praying. He won't eat. He'll only sleep on the ground. He won't listen to us. Now he's dead. What's going to happen now? You know what their fear probably thought? They probably thought he was going to kill himself. He might do something drastic. And I love this. David noticed that his servants were whispering among them. And that the child was, and he realized the child's probably dead. And so he asked, is my son dead? And they said, yes, your son is dead. And you know what's crazy? It's, remember I said accept the consequences? Let me tell you what true accepting the consequences is. Look what David did. It said David got up from the ground, went and took a shower, put on lotions, perfume, and it, he went in the house of the Lord and worshiped God. You're like, what? In fact, when they saw that, they were like, are you crazy? Why aren't you more disturbed? Why aren't you more freaked out? Why aren't you more angry? And he's like, no, consequences are done. In fact, as you read later, you find out he was praying the whole time, hoping God might change his mind. He was hoping that the more he pleaded, the more he might go, God, but please, I apologize. I'm, I'm serious. I'm going to change. I'm going to be different. But please save my son. Please save my son. And he's like, I'm not going to stop praying. But the minute the baby was dead, he's like, okay, that's God's consequences. I can't change them. And what does he do? He doesn't say, I hate you, God. I'm never going to follow you again. You suck. I'm never going to church again. In fact, I'm going to now become an atheist and try and prove that you are, there is no God. Now, you know what he says? Let me take a shower, look all nice, and then he went and worshiped God. You want to know what true repentance is? Is when there's consequences in your life, you instead of getting angry, you go, God, you know what? I deserved it, but I'm going to keep worshiping you. See, that's when you start to see, whoa. Maybe David was a little different. He did some hard stuff that I'm never going to do. I'm never going to murder someone. I don't ever plan on cheating on another with another woman, ever. But yet, but yet, the way he responded is why God said, that's a man after my own heart. If you want to ha- know what true repentance looks like, one, it's don't make excuses anymore. Two, is turn from your sin. Say, I'm, I'm going to try not to do that anymore. That's not what I'm going to struggle with anymore. I'm going to try. And there's a turning. Doesn't mean you might fall back again, but then you turn. There's a real turning. Not the, oh, yeah, I promise I won't do that again. Psych. My fingers were crossed. And third is you accept the consequences, and, and that's what's amazing about it. But here's what's cool. The story doesn't end there. Here's the good news. The good news is, that God really will forgive you. Do you know how I, why I know not only will he forgive you because the Bible says it, that he will make you new. Why does know that he forgives all of our sins? He will forgive all your sins. No, I want you to know something. He can still redeem your story. Your story's not done. How do I know? Because King David's story was not done. You know what's crazy? It says this. Then David, in t- verse 24, David comforted his wife Bathsheba. You know, she just lost her son. He just lost his son. They're crying. They're comforting. It says, and he went to her and lie with her. And they gave birth to another son. And they named him Solomon. Does anybody know about a king named Solomon? What do we know about Solomon? Anyone? Come here. Give me me a thing. Someone tell me something about Solomon. Yes. Okay, he also had a lot of wives. He had the same mistakes his dad did. Heck yeah. He did struggle with that. What are some good things about Solomon? Yes. He was the wisest man who ever lived. One more thing. A big thing. Um, I don't know what you're saying there, but um, I don't know him eating the pineapple. I don't know. Okay. Um, Anything else? He was the next king. He also is the one that built the temple. He's the one that got to build the temple. You're like, whoa. So guess what? This is Bathsheba's first son. Because they sinned, he kills the first son. He says, sorry, that's your consequence. And he could have said, you're done, Bathsheba. And he's like, no. Guess how much I still love you. Because the way you respond to David, not only am I going to still give you a son that's going to rule, it's going to be the son from Bathsheba. Wow. He's the one I'm going to use. He's the one that's going to be one of the greatest. There's going to be the most peace in the world because of your repentance. 
I wonder if we don't get it. We don't get I think we think we're not supposed to sin. I think we think this game in life is don't sin, and I think we don't get it. The game in life is we're going to sin, but it's how we respond when we sin. And maybe God's saying, listen, you're so worried about I'm not good enough. And he's saying, I know you're not good enough, but it's how you respond. That's why I had to pay for you. That's why my son came and died on the cross, because I know you're not good enough. He had to pay the price. But listen, it's how you respond. It's you saying, I own up to it. It's my mistake. I'm trying to, I'm not going to do it again, God. I'm going to be different. I'm going to turn from the sin. And you know what? If there's consequence, I'm okay, because it's not going to stop me from worshiping you. It's not. David, a man after God's own heart. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you so much for who you are. Lord, I know I went a little long. But Lord, would you just teach us about how we respond? It's how we respond when we sin. Lord, we'll probably never do anything as bad as David. But Lord, may we have his heart that we respond the way David did. Love you so much in your name. Amen.